there now. It feels like a summer rain. You know, there's the cold winter rain, there's the fall with the leaves coming down, there's a the spring with the fresh air and the, the new smell of the ground, but this is a summer rain and it's different and I like it. So, uh, some, some specific announcements. Um, we have uh, a choir that's known as the North Country Singers, Adirondack Singers and Players. Uh, the Journey of Hope is coming uh, to the North Country this weekend, Friday and Saturday. Uh, ask anybody about it, but if you don't ask anybody, I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, Friday, or pardon me, Saturday at 3 o'clock at the Hogansburg United Methodist Church, and then Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock, Brazier Falls at the United Methodist Church. Presentation by the group. Uh, two of our choir are a part of that. Uh, another announcement to let you know there are things going on that we don't have answers to. Um, there's a mission program beginning somewhere over with the Messina community and the Methodist Church is over there. I'll be attending this afternoon, 1 o'clock, at an invitation uh, from Pastor Corey Loudon at First Methodist in Messina. She's wanting to put together some mission programs. I don't know a whole lot. I'll know more when I get back and I'll be able to share with our mission committee and with, uh, with others then. So are there uh, other announcements we need to be aware of? Okay. Prayer time for the challenge, times of celebration. We create community and it's part of what draws us together and reinforces our relationships as what we call a church family. It's very real. It's not something made up. It is relationships built through time and experiences shared. This morning, we share in worship.
Thank you. I'm Reverend Carl Chamberlain. For those that are joining at a distance, my wife is Pastor Heidi Chamberlain, the pastor assigned here at the Potsdam United Methodist Church. I'm covering for her while she's recovering herself from uh, knee replacement. She's doing exceptionally well. We're almost three weeks in now, and she's moved from, uh, from major pain to much more comfort. She's now getting around the house with uh, without a cane, without assistance most of the time. I'm very pleased with that. We're continuing with physical therapy and, uh, and seeing the doctor on a regular basis. We're looking forward to uh, having this behind us and then uh, enjoying the summer. Uh, we'll be doing it again in the fall when uh, she's scheduled for a second. So my sense is that I will be back and joining you then. But between now and, uh, and when she's able to return, we are community. Uh, this is the last Sunday for our choir until fall. Uh, it's good to take a break now and again. Jesus went to the mountains and he went to the waters and enjoyed the offerings of creation in his own place and time. I'm hoping that when you have some time away, you're able to enjoy the mountains, the waters here in the North Country. With that in mind, it provides a theme for our, for our liturgy. Uh, the liturgy for choir is taken from Psalm 5, verse 3. It was written back in 1888 by a fellow by the name of Daniel Warner. Uh, it's organized as, as a song, as the psalms often were, with uh, response and repetition refrain. With that, join me this morning in our liturgy for the choir. O God, inspire our morning hymn of love and gratitude. O bless the sacrifice we bring, thou source of every good. Touched by thy hand of love, we wake and rise from sweet repose. The glorious sun has driven far the mystic shades of night. So that our souls, the morning star, have shed its twilight. Touched by thy hand of love, we wake and rise from sweet repose. Thy grace shall first in silence break, thy peace within us flows. Amen. Would you stand as you are able with me for our opening hymn on page 154, I'll Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, verses 1, 4, 5, and 6.
Thank you. You may be seated. Hear these good words. Do not lose heart. God strengths, God seeks to strengthen our souls, filling us with forgiveness and wonder and joy. Glory to you, God of mercy and grace. You want only the best for us. And so we sing praises to you. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. And God's people say, amen. Excellent. You'll be missed. <laughs> Our scriptures for the day. First Samuel, chapter eight, voice of, excuse me. Chapter 8, verses 4 through 11. So all the Israelite elders got together and went to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, listen, you are old now and your sons don't follow in your footsteps. So appoint us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. It seemed very bad to Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So he prayed to the Lord. The Lord answered Samuel, comply with the people's wishes request. Everything you ask of you, because they haven't rejected you. No, they have rejected me as king over them. 
They are doing to you only what they've been doing to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this very minute, abandoning me and worshiping other gods. So comply with their request, but give them a clear warning, telling them how the king will rule over them. Then Samuel explained everything to the Lord had said to the people who were asking for a king. This is how the king will rule over you, Samuel said. He will take your sons and he will use them for his chariots and his cavalry and as runners for his chariots. <clears throat> now, if you please rejoin, uh, join me in the responsive reading on page uh, 853 of our hymnal. It's Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I come to your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called you, you strengthened my life. All the rulers of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing all the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is high, but regards the lowly, yet knows the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. O Lord, fulfill your purpose for me. O Lord, may your steadfast love endure forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. There's a quote in the bulletin this morning from Peter Yarrow. When people sing together, community is created. Together we rejoice, we celebrate, we mourn, and we comfort each other. Through music, we reach others' hearts and souls. Music allows us to find a connection. That's Peter Yarrow. You may not recognize the name, but you'll recognize the music group of which she was a part, because I know you're of that generation. Peter, Paul, and Mary. The uh, gospel for today I have on another page. Would someone find a Bible for me and open it up? Here you go. The good news of Jesus Christ according to St. Mark, third chapter beginning the 20th. This is Jesus and the stories around Jesus. This is the story from Mark, his record. Then he, Jesus, went home and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem sat, said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he, Jesus, called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. 
And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they had said he has an unclean spirit. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I grew up in New York's southern tier back in the 50s and 60s. It was much like what I read about in the Great Depression. I heard stories from my mom and my dad who grew up then during that depression. And they talked about boys wearing shoes to church in the summer but going barefoot the rest of the time. It was as much about preserving shoe leather as it was for comfort. I learned from the stories they and my grandparents told about shortages and making do and something, and I had a taste of it one time, called vinegar pie. An ins inexpensive substitute for lemon. And I tell you, it tastes like a lemon pie used when money was short, as it was often. Most farmers were also part of the volunteer fire department responding when the fire whistle blew across the valley. They'd help with a neighbor's house or barn fire. I remember one Christmas dinner. It was interrupted by that whistle and my dad leaving an unfinished meal, hearing when he returned that it was not a fire, but a neighbor's cow breaking through the river ice when the small herd of dairy cattle were being watered because pipes in the barn had frozen in the cold. When there was a need, neighbors did not ask questions. They simply responded to help where there was a need. And they all know that if the need was in their own family, the community would come to help them too. There were a few families with more than the average. Perhaps their farms were on better ground or the present family had received a head start from a grandfather or uncle who had built up the herd, the farm equipment, and had a house in decent shape handing it down with an understanding they'd be cared for in their own declining years by the younger generation. These constructive and caring relationships were not only on the farms, but in towns too. Large gardens would be shared with neighbors. A load of wood or a small load of coal sent to the widows or left for a struggling family, often without a note. One of my third grade classmates often came to school in the winter with the smell of kerosene on his clothes as his family did not have money for either fuel, for other fuel, and cold water was all they had in their house. But we got along and made do together. And it never seemed to me as a youngster that anyone deserved better treatment than anyone else or that anyone would be denied assistance because of personal or family challenges. Pity, and that's the word I chose intentionally, pity was extended to the family of the local alcoholic whose work record was spotty. Farmers knew he was a good worker when sober but that would last only until he got paid. Still, his wife and kids needed to eat and have heat in their home, despite the man's difficulties. Folks simply did what they could 
because it was the right thing to do. Friends or not, these were neighbors, and we cared for and about our neighbors. I'd like to think today as a pastor that these mutual supports were influenced by our shared participation in church and Sunday worship. Truthfully though, even then attending church was in decline. But the values taught in church and learned from scripture through the generations had to have made a difference in those who chose to attend and their actions would serve as an example and model for others. I am convinced that it was so then and continues to be an influence and guides our communities today, even without knowing it's happening. We stand on the shoulders of others and on the foundations learned through the generations before us. The small, quiet ways care is extended to one another in times of need argue that what Jesus taught continues to guide and influence all of us. These things are simply the right things to do. We do them because we want to do right and we want to do good in our time on this earth. And I believe the church is the best place to practice this and to teach future generations what has sustained our families and communities for all these years. Laws, legislation, community organizations, social service initiatives and charities each have value. But many times it is people of practicing faith that are behind them. Collectively, we do these things to help one another to support the less fortunate, to create safety and comfort, because these are the right things to do. Not far beneath the service, you'll usually find it's people of faith who are the leaders and supporters making things happen for others still. Jesus was doing good and setting an active example for others to follow. Not everyone understood what he was doing. Some even worked actively to block his work and access to places of public gathering, seeing his actions as disruptive in ways that we might understand today. Why help those folks? Can't they work like the rest of us? Why do they get to live off the rest of us hardworking people? Don't tell me that you've never heard that sort of conversation. Yes, I was sheltered from those conversations when I was growing up. They were there and as much a part of the community then as today, I'm still convinced of that. My parents did not participate in them, those conversations. And they made sure our exposure as children was to the values and actions that would form our own choices and values as an adult. I eventually realized I'd been given a different opportunity to come to adulthood, formed by the values and examples my parents embraced, hoping that they would become my own. I'd like to think they have. From Mark's report this morning, Jesus experienced some serious opposition. Some readers will interpret that even Jesus' own family were condemning his values at times and even the people he worked with and assisted. He was accused of doing the devil's own work. You've all heard a variation of that old country saying, the proof is in the pudding essentially results count. This is essentially what Jesus offered, how he responded. The devil's supporters are not going to oppose the devil. Good work stands as its own evidence that the right things are happening. The pudding 
so to speak, of good actions for others was the witness in the trial of Jesus in that public challenge. Good was happening. How could that be argued against? It could not. And Jesus and those listening knew it too. We know very little of the family life of Jesus, but this passage, this specific one, seems to indicate that there were an extended family of our Lord in this region. The reference directs our attention to them, uh, mother, brothers and sisters as his family. The scripture reference we, we heard begins, he replied, who is my mother, who are my brothers? Looking around those seated with him in a circle, he said, look, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my mother, and my sisters. My parents taught me about family. They taught me not with their words, but by their actions. They taught me that there are three sorts of relationships that make us family. And I say, yes, us, intentionally. Three sorts of relationships. The first is by blood. Who are you born to? <laughs> who are you born to? That's blood relation. The second is who are you tied to? Marriage is a legal contract, as are other things like adoption. Who are you born to? Who are you tied to? But the third sort of relationship that makes us family is by choice. Who are you choosing for your family? You may have heard and even used these phrases. This is my brother from a different mother. <laughs> We're sisters by choice. And cousins who have no blood relatives in common. These are as much and sometimes more real as family than those by law or blood. Choice in family and relationships and how we live them out. This month has two designated celebrations I never heard about as a youngster. Now part of our national experience. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed December 20th, 1863. <clears throat> the American Civil War extended almost 16 months later with the Confederate surrender on April 9, 1865. <clears throat> April. 1865. Union troops entered Galveston, Texas more than two months later. And on June 19, 1865, they brought news of the end of the war and the end of slavery to that holdout community in Texas, the Deep South. Juneteenth acknowledges the real end of the inhumanity of slavery in our country on that date, now a federal holiday. Our medical community, social scientists and others have acknowledged that between five and 6% of our human population are and always have oriented differently than the majority when it comes to relationships. That means out of 20 members of our families, at least one of your family and mine are represented. At least one out of 20 of our own relatives, family, friend, and circle. Pride celebrations are a growing recognition of what has always been and an opportunity to acknowledge and repair brokenness in relationships and in our families and in our communities. I struggled to understand this for years, both as an individual and as a person of Christian faith. My question, I, for years, for years, heartbreaking, deep wrestling. My questions were answered 
and my concerns satisfied when a niece of mine came to me and said, Uncle Carl, you can't help who you fall in love with. That's so simple. And it answered so many of my questions. So, who is family? I listen to Jesus. He says his family, sisters, brothers, parents, is found in the relationships that do good together. So many times, folks, so many times, our questions want to tear us down and divide us, one from another. It's almost as if the Civil War continues and is still at work. The family of Jesus is found among those who work together to do good. And if that's good enough for Jesus, perhaps that's good enough for us too. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, you uh, create us for relationships. When Jesus was asked about the greatest of commandments, he spoke about relationships, first with you and then with each other, the people we meet from day to day. And if we can get our heads open and our arms around these things, everything else seems to fall into place. Forgive us, Lord, for making things too complicated. Forgive us for our errors following our own thoughts and ways and not listening to what we've been taught by your presence among us, the one we call Emmanuel. Help us get better at being your people. All of this through Christ our Lord, we pray and God's people say, Amen. down the bulletin. Marshall, thank you. Would you join me in our next hymn on page 168, at the name of Jesus.
Thank you. You may be seated. We have shared our prayer requests earlier today. Uh, yesterday, we celebrated the life and witness and our memories of Warren Potter. Please continue to hold the family in your thoughts and prayers. I will often use two forms of prayer during my portion here. First, from someone that I respect who speaks to the issues of today. Oftentimes, uh, I look for something that speaks to conflict around the world. Uh, this is from Reverend Tom Schumann, a pastor who has been writing liturgy and poems and worship material for now well over 20 years. The second is a form called a bidding prayer, which asks us to pray for specific things and to join together with that in mind. Let's pray. When we are too weary to take another step on the road to the kingdom, when our hearts are worn down by the pain always rubbing against our lives, when we are wasting away because of fears and worries, you come, soul strengthener, stretching out your hand to hold us in your love. When everyone else has turned their backs on us and walked away, when we cry out in the night, not only to find the world has turned a deaf ear to us, when folks think we are crazy because we believe that good can overcome evil, love can conquer hate, hope can replace despair, you do not forsake us, but stay at our side, brother to all people. When our doubts rub a callus on our souls, when we wonder if we are able to see your kingdom emerging all around us, when others seem to want only the worst for us, you pull us out of harm's way, spirit of faith and hope. We pray now to the Lord who always hears our voice. We pray for the church that may always teach the mercy of God. We pray for people who are anxious that they may hear a message of hope. For those with difficult situations at home, that they may get the help they need. For students and teachers completing their year together, that the Lord may be close to them. for peace in the Ukraine, Palestine, and Israel, and that the innocent people may be protected. For a safety on our roads and in the water, that God may protect us during these summer days. That our prayers spoken and silent may be heard through your Holy Spirit. Lastly, Lord, we pray for our people who have died, especially Warren, that when the tent we live in here on earth is folded up, we may live in God's house forever. In your mercy, hear our prayers. With you, O Lord, there is mercy and fullness of redemption. Hear our prayers and show us your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who are in heaven. Thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. We lay in our presentation, so to our hearts, for thy name is the King, and the power, and the glory. The time for our offering as a part of our worship is here. Um, our church does 
number of missional things over the course of the year. Uh, one of those is a seasonal one that the congregation has been an active participant in for, for quite a number of years, and Kathy's going to speak about that. Please. The uh, beach programs will begin on July 8th. So the, the mission team is asking your help to help supply peanut butter and jelly, small bags of chips, box juices, and individual prepackaged desserts. So this is a short-term mission. It doesn't take a lot of people. So we will need a couple of volunteers to help us make some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We're gonna try two days a week this year as opposed to only one. So roughly last year, I think we packed 30 lunches, 15 for each beach. We do Norwood and Postwood beaches. This is, I've been told the children love this bag lunch <laughs> that they get. Last year, we put little stickers in this year. I've got another different kind of stickers, Not, nothing. It's hard to find something that doesn't have weapons in it and spikes coming out of their hands. but. I managed to find some nonviolent stickers that we can put in the um, bag lunches, and they seemed to enjoy that, and they didn't seem to end up all over the buildings at the beach, at the beaches, so that's a good thing. So um, we'll be packing. We'll, the first day we pack is on um, 7:10 and 7:12. So um, it only takes a couple people to bag to make the peanut butter jelly peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, then a couple people to throw the other sides into the bags. And then usually I can take them to Postwood to deliver or, you know, Marsha can go to Norwood, but we need to deliver them by noon. So we need your help in su supplying the contents to put inside the bags. So the mission board isn't done yet. I'm sorry, it will be by next Sunday. I have a list of the um, stuff that we need. So um, that will be on the mission table. And then um, I guess that's it. And uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your help. As always, we are very grateful for the support that you give our mission team. Every time we come to you, you pour out your hearts and you open them up to the people in our community. And we are always, always very grateful for everything that you do to help us so, so this church can reach out beyond these four walls and do the very thing that Pastor Carl has talked about today. So thank you, everybody. If you've ever sent kids to a summer program, you know that there are families that, if there's a nominal cost, uh, receive scholarships to go. There are families that don't have the resources to take care of their kids during the summer as they want. So sometimes with these summer programs, it's a way for families to make sure the kids not only get uh, look, looked after and have some fun activities, but also get something so simple as lunch. This is an opportunity to do, as Jesus said, to, to feed the hungry. It's as simple as that. Some of these kids are from families where the kids, if they don't come for the summer programs, they might not get a summer lunch. Something so simple as, as this can make a, a huge difference. Be generous, give with your hearts. Time for our offerings months. <clears throat>
Looking together to our bulletin, would you join me in the prayer of dedication over the offering? Let's pray. God of all creation, in humble gratitude we offer our gifts, celebrating your steadfast love that endures forever. As we reflect on your faithfulness, help us align our hearts with your divine rhythm. Guide us to sing your praises boldly, inviting others to join in the song of your love. Amid trials and triumphs, may our worship be a public statement to your enduring grace. As we acknowledge our human frailty, reassure us of your unwavering presence. Lead us in the work of your hands, empowering us to love as you love. Bless these offerings, expanding your love in our community and beyond. Amen. Our closing hymn you'll find on 188, Christ is the world's light. Folks, as I said earlier, the choir is uh, taking a suspension in their services uh, this summer, but I think it would be appropriate for us to give our thanks to them for what they've done uh, this last season. Thank you so much, choir. Yes, there is juice and coffee and cookies out back. Receive this benediction, if you would join me. We leave this place of worship with a song in our hearts and music in our ears. May the joy of the Lord be us wherever we go. Amen. Receive this blessing as well. In the name of Almighty God, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, go to love and to serve in all that you do. Amen. Amen.